Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. We're going to get going in just about two minutes. So if you can take your seats at the back and then also silence your phones, I'd be grateful. Thank you. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President of Communications and Policy Outreach, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome so many of you to the Centre early this Monday morning uh, for what proves to be a really interesting discussion, I hope. Um, as you know, this week we're expecting to see uh, a budget request from the Trump administration that outlines spending plans and spending reductions. The US foreign affairs budget is one area where many are bracing for deep cuts, maybe as much as 37%. That's one of the figures that's been banded around. Whatever the final figure, there do look certain to be some hard choices to be made ahead. Today, we're going to explore a range of opinions from across the political spectrum with some think tank experts uh, in the field. We also want to hear from as many of you as possible. A lot of you bring expertise and equally strong views. Uh, so that's for you in the room and also to many of you who are watching online on the live stream, hello to you. And if you'd like to join in the conversation as well, there are a couple of ways to do that. If you're watching on our live stream page at the bottom, there's a comment section, so please just leave your question in there. Similarly, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, there's a comments box at the bottom of the video window there. You can leave your question there. And please tell us who you are and what your affiliation is as well. You can also tweet your question directly to us. Our uh, handle is at CGDev, and please use the hashtag CGD Talks. It's on the screen behind people there. Uh, and if you're tweeting in the room as well, which we very much encourage you to do, please also use the hashtag CGD Talks. Let's get a conversation going. So we hope very much to hear from you in the room and you online uh, as well. And of course, we're going to be hearing a lot from our experts. Some of the questions that we're going to think about today include, what would substantial funding reductions mean for US efforts to advance global development and for US interests more broadly? What does the evidence tell us about US investments in foreign aid? And how can the administration and Congress work to ensure the best use of American assistance dollars? So with that framing, let's introduce uh, our panel. Uh, Daniel Pletka is a senior vice president for foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, in a 2015 conversation with then exiting USAID administrator Raj Shah, uh, Danielle said, when people talk about handouts to foreigners, it has to be understood as a component of a strategy that preempts the necessity of a military engagement, that builds a foundation of market economic life that is the strongest deterrent to disorder. Did my research. Well, it sounded intelligent, too. <laughs> 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 I know, right? If that's all you come up with today, you're off the hook. Excellent. I'm sure it won't be. 
Um, John Norris, the Executive Director of Sustainable Security and Peacebuilding Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Uh, in 2011, going back a bit, I'm sure you've said much since then, but among, uh, John wrote about uh, the five ways that US foreign aid could be less wasteful, including among them he, he listed reduced tide aid, reduced agricultural subsidies, reduced earmarks. Scott Morris from CGD, Senior Fellow, Director of the US Development Policy Initiative. In a recent blog, Scott wrote, the White House has decided to politicize foreign aid in a way not seen for 30 years. And Jim Roberts, Research Fellow for Economic Freedom and Growth at the Heritage Foundation, uh, interviewed by the LA Times this January about foreign aid. He wrote that he just wants to really just overhaul the whole mechanism of US foreign aid, and he's opposed to it continuing as it is. So quite a diverse range of opinions. What we're going to do is that we'll get some initial thoughts on our first question from everyone to kick us off. Then I'll moderate a bit of a discussion before the panel amongst the panelists, and then we'll go to audience questions with plenty of time for those. So panelists, with that in mind, uh, let's kick off and let's get a response from all of you. Daniel, starting with you. Uh, what is the case for cuts to the foreign assistance budget in particular, alongside the EPA? It's international affairs, development and diplomacy that were highlighted by the White House. So what's that about? And what's the effect? And then the same question to all of you. Well, I, I mean, I think the case is very straightforward. When you're cutting most everything, then foreign aid is going to be cut. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think there's a greater case that needs to be made for it than cuts are being made across the board. Now, I think that the real issue and the question that, that faces many of us is the, is the proposed 37% cut, um, cut to the 150 account with the, uh, the State Department, AID, and others. And uh, my understanding about that is that that's, that, that certainly is the number. Um, and that there's not going to be a lot of pushback. So, you know, I, I think that there's an opportunity here to make the best of a situation which is actually to do the kinds of things we've all been talking about as necessary, which is to, if I may quote Rahm Emanuel, take this crisis and take advantage of it. Um, that is to look for an overhaul in how we think about aid and how the State Department is structured, how AID is structured. Because the one thing I think you will have consensus on, no matter how you feel about the budget or where it goes or what it is, is that we have had a foreign policy um, outreach establishment that was basically estab established at the end of the 1940s and has not in any major way transformed since then. Yes, there have been tweaks. Yes, there have been trimming of the sails and some additional people put on here and some bureaus changed. But generally speaking, we have, we have an, uh, an archaic uh, structure that lends itself to the sort of fiddling and also, frankly, to the argument that's made by a lot of opponents of aid that it is not effective. So now is the opportunity to do the right thing. What is the case otherwise? Look, the case otherwise is that there's a very small constituency for, for foreign aid when you take it out there in this administration. Yeah, I think, first of all, we need to really abuse ourselves of the notion that there's a policy here. Uh, you know, all over town, we've got groups of smart people trying to come up with some idea and some rationale for what the administration is saying and doing. There isn't a clear thought out policy. This was not a budget cut that was arrived at after a serious process. You know, I think it's a mirror of what we're seeing with healthcare. You know, that there was six years to work on this. This was a high priority. And they come back with a system that will apparently cover 10 million less people and cost more money. Uh, you know, that's not a policy. And maybe throw in a half trillion dollar tax credit for child care because Ivanka wants a pony. You know, we've seen the same thing on international affairs. How did they arrive at a 37% cut? The Secretary of State wasn't consulted. Nobody at AID was. This is just somebody in OMB in the White House came up with a number on a napkin. Uh, and sure, you could arrive at efficiencies in foreign assistance. Uh, you could in any department, except apparently the Pentagon. Uh, and there are smart ways to do it. But there is zero sign any practical thinking has actually gone into a coherent plan to use less money or rationalize the system or bring it into a modern era. Um, so, you know, I think it will be a reactive process. And uh, there's lots of folks on the Hill, including Republicans, who uh, think that a uh, more than a third cut in international affairs will undermine it, American interests. Um, so I think that's the way it'll play out. Yeah, so I, let me echo, frankly, 
John's views on this. I, I think um, if I wanted to try to make the case for contemplating cuts of this sort, it would be sort of, well, you know, fiscal discipline. This is, this is what we talk about really, no matter what the external landscape is for the past 10 years now. Uh, tough choices. Um, but frankly, I, you know, I look at this, and, and particularly the highlighting of foreign assistance um, alongside EPA uh, for cuts from this White House, and uh, you know, th this is to fiscal discipline as the carrier deal was to a jobs program. It really, it is symbolism over actual policy. <clears throat> and I think it's important to, to start by recognizing those politics because it really does affect the ability to do um, the more substantive kind of um, uh, policy making ar around hard choices. Where, where can we achieve uh, greater cost efficiency in our foreign assistance budget? But if your starting point is to pretend that this thing that, you know, all told international affairs is just over 1% of, of our budget outlays, that somehow that is achieving uh, whatever your goals are on fiscal policy. That, that really is, is, as I wrote, it, I think poisons the water for, for trying to have a, a meaningful, substantive conversation <laughs> about these issues. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me this morning. <clears throat> well, I disagree. Uh, and I think uh, there are a number of things to look at here. The, uh, the U.S. defense budget was cut steadily during the Obama administration. It is, I think, 24 percent lower than it was eight years ago. The foreign assistance, the F1, the uh, 150 account has been increased dramatically, especially in the first couple of years of the, of the Obama administration. Uh, we looked at FY 2006 versus FY 2016 for uh, the International Affairs Function 150 account and found that it had increased 74%. So while you have a 24% cut in DOD, you have a U.S. military that is worn out from almost two decades of war. You have equipment that's broken uh, and it needs to be replaced and fixed. Uh, you've got to start, in our opinion, on the conservative side, you have to start to uh, fix it. And so where's the money going to come from? Now, today we're not going to have a debate about the entitlement situation in the federal budget. That exists and everybody knows it. Uh, and that just, you're not, this is not the time or place to have that discussion. So we're looking at the discretionary part of the federal budget. Uh, the administration wants to increase the DOD budget by $54 billion. Where is the money going to come from? Well, it's going to have to come from areas that are generally uh, voluntary spending. And one of those areas is the 150 account, where, in fact, we have seen very large increases uh, over the last eight years. And some of them uh, really not very effective in terms of making the world safer. Uh, and in fact, uh, my colleague uh, Jim Carafano wrote that cutting the foreign aid budget will make the world safer because it will increase the DOD budget so the DOD is better prepared to go after people like Joseph Kony's Lord Resistance Army in Central Africa, uh, which is a major impediment to the well-being of the people in that region, uh, and, um, and is better prepared to keep the world safe for increased uh, global trade, uh, shipping, airways, and that kind of thing that have benefited the whole world. So uh, this is something that should not also come as a surprise when a Republican administration takes in, over, over from a Democrat. You recall Jimmy Carter drew down the U.S. military after the Vietnam War. Reagan built it up to win the Cold War. Uh, Bill Clinton drew it down after the Cold War was over, after the Bush 41 uh, era. And then uh, the rude, horrible awakening of 9-11 and, and Bush 43 raised it, and only to have Obama draw it down again. So these are cycles we're seeing. This is, this is not uh, really new in some senses. Uh, the, uh, Heritage Foundation has long supported an overhaul of USAID. Uh, we have a paper out that quoted um, the, U the 2001 U.S. Commission on National Security, the Hart Rudman Commission, that talked about what a bureaucratic morass USAID was, larded up by Congress with so many earmarks and tasks as to make it incoherent. In practice, no one was in charge. Neither the Secretary of State nor the AID Administrator could coordinate fully foreign assistance activities to avoid duplication. Uh, nobody was integrating these programs and bought into broader uh, preventive strategies. Um, and I could go on, but uh, that is something we hope to see come out of as, 
as Danny said, uh, the, the good out of this uh, major dramatic uh, shift in priorities will be to fully integrate USAID into the State Department, you know, not have separate regional assistant secretaries and administrative expenses in two different organizations, but have one organization focused on uh, the national security priorities of the United States. Thank you very much, uh, panelists, for your opening comments there. Uh, let's pick up on a point that you brought up there, uh, Jim, and get comments from all of you. This relationship between defense and development. I mean, there are the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, and development, much promoted by the Obama administration, but by previous administrations before that as well. And also, you know, you'll remember just recently, uh, our friends at USGLC coordinated a letter from 121 retired military leaders talking about the importance of diplomacy and development for defense. And actually, the current defense secretary, James Mattis, in a previous incarnation as commander of US Central Command, said, if you don't fully fund state, I will need to buy more ammunition. So when you talk about the world being a safer place if you get rid of foreign aid, how does that square with what all these military leaders are saying? Let's get your comments on that, and let's get some other let's get other people just to jump in when you when you want I, to. I totally agree with General Mattis, General Petraeus, others who have who worked alongside AID and state and the provincial teams. That those were very important projects in Afghanistan and Iraq. And when there is a smaller budget, we certainly wanted to keep it focused on the Middle East on these trouble spots from Afghanistan to the Rift Valley that have really been at the core of problems uh, where pro properly constructed and focused AID projects can work. I th so it's not surprising that generals would have said that and found that interesting. The problem is in other parts of the world where the assistance is too little to really make a difference, it's kind of gold-plated. You have, first of all, humanitarian assistance that nobody can predict, but it certainly has to have, we have to have something on hand for uh, natural disasters, tragedies, ongoing suffering. And as you know, the Pentagon often responds very well uh, to those issues too. But then security assistance also needs to be overhauled. Uh, it uh, has not been uh, distributed with maximum effect and has been hindered by his history and by earmarks. And then on development assistance uh, to facilitate economic growth and development, really the record is inconclusive and counterproductive at, at times. And that's been, in fact, the Heritage Foundation started this Index of Economic Freedom in 1995 specifically to be a roadmap for economic development in the world that, to replace donor assistance from around the world. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's really our answer. The rule of law, uh, control, and e efficiency of spending by governments, and efficiency of regulation of markets, openness to trade and investment, those are the issues that help countries grow. And uh, the Hudson uh, Institute, I think this week, is, is publishing its global uh, ph philanthropy uh, study, which shows a huge difference now compared to 25 years ago in the amount of money around the world available to countries. It's something like $800 billion versus of total financial flows versus uh, $170 billion of total donor aid, and of which uh, $64 billion is, is philanthropy, real philanthropy. Uh, uh, from private giving by Americans and others to help people overseas. So there are a lot of ways now that countries can, can be helped and not the old traditional models uh, really have to be overhauled. So let, let, let me just come back to something Jim said earlier. I, I think it is a mischaracterization, uh, particularly looking at the last eight years, that somehow we have starved the defense budget in order to pump up foreign assistance. I mean, let's be clear, we're talking about vastly different scale here in these budgets. Um, so yes, uh, international affairs budget has increased, but if you take all of the increase that occurred in the last eight years, it is still about a percent of the defense budget. Um, and you know, a as you said, Rajesh, in, in quoting the letter from the generals, um, certainly in the defense community, this is not viewed as an area of, of trading off, that in fact these are these are elements of the same toolkit. Um, and if we look back to the Bush administration, this was a period where yes, you saw growth in the military budget, but you also saw a very affirmative stance, uh, particularly on foreign assistance with the creation of major initiatives that are really flagships today for our foreign assistance programs in the areas of global health, in the creation of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. So that was done during you know a period where you had ambition on both fronts, and the case for that, I think, is just as strong today as it was then. Okay, 
Let's get some comments from the yeah, Let's not pretend that what the Trump administration <laughs> is doing is normal Republican politics. The, the biggest jumps in the foreign assistance budget since the Marshall Plan happened under Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush because they saw it as imperative to uh, advancing America's interests around the globe. And the consensus around uh, protecting America and advancing its interests has always been that expanding the number of peaceable, free market democracies is the best security strategy. We now see an administration that is making a frontal assault on that very concept, that they want to dismantle NATO, that they're going after EU, that they want to hobble the State Department, they want to take the legs out from international assistance. That is not normal Republican security or international strategy. It is profoundly different. It is nihilism, and I think it is going to be incredibly destructive. Uh, and I think Jim's guilty of cherry-picking numbers a little bit here. Yes, the Pentagon budget has gone down a little bit in recent years. We were fighting two land wars in Asia. Defense budgets are supposed to go down when you're not fighting hot wars. That's how it works. The defense budget went down after World War II. It went down after Korea. It went down after Vietnam. It is more expensive to invade countries. You know, that's how it works. It isn't this idea that we have to maintain a maximal defense budget at all times, no matter what we're doing in the world. So I think we are in uh, uncharted waters, and I don't think we should accept characterizations that this is just business as usual. Are you cherry picking, Jim? No, certainly not. It's, in fact, uh, you know, the, uh, the issue of Reagan, and those were uh, times when there was a battle for hearts and minds. There was an accentuation that started with Jimmy Carter on human rights. So, in fact, to the extent that uh, budgets were increased, it was done to kind of bring down the Soviet Union, I think. But uh, it was always focused on an, an, a more or less immediate national security goal, not very theoretical, long-term you know, goals. I mean, really, solutions that are going to take generations to really to achieve around the world. The three Ds. So, um, let me sort of first make a general statement. I find that all of us are horribly ill-served by the notion that we should be um, offensive to the administration. I know it's deeply satisfying, um, and uh, God knows uh, I have my own thoughts about such things that I share at my dinner table, as I did about the Obama administration. But I don't believe that the best path forward uh, to uh, augment the 150 account is to suggest that the budget was written on the back of a napkin, even if it was. <laughs> <laughs> nor, uh, nor do I think that it is the best way forward to suggest that um, to suggest that somehow um, these are a bunch of um, that these are a bunch of you know, hillbilly creeps who are uh, who are uh, trying to destroy our foreign uh, policy or our foreign aid. Um, it, not because, again, you might not think that, but because it just doesn't really get us anywhere. It's just the sort of satisfying tantrum that some of us like to throw. And um, so I really want to suggest that as a, as a talking point forward. Um, so give us, I, your, give us so, your whiteboard. So here's my thinking. Um, I don't think a 37% cut is a good idea. Uh, but not because there shouldn't be cuts, but because uh, I do believe, uh, notwithstanding the also incredibly useless practice of getting people to sign letters, um, not because 100 plus generals said so, but because in fact, if you don't want to fight wars, you do need to actually do something. And the best way to articulate our foreign policy is in fact through effective programs that enhance democratic capitalism. Uh, which uh, involves a whole series of things. I remember under the Obama administration that things that I believe in uh, got crap kicked out of them, MCC, OPEC, things like that. Um, those are certainly controversial uh, among conservatives as well. Accusations of crony capitalism and things like that don't help. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we need to recognize is that there are going to be cuts Frankly, I don't think that the cuts to the de I don't think that the defense budget increase is sufficient. Three percent over what Barack Obama uh, uh, asked for is not what I would call an astonishing number. Uh, to the contrary, especially when you understand that fifty percent of the defense budget goes off in entitlements, it is not actually for war fighting. 
by the way, the wars aren't over. Last I checked, we are in combat in Syria, in Iraq, some of us in Yemen, in Libya, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere that we don't talk about. So there are wars still going on, and we need to do well. So how do we make a case? I mean, that's the real question. How do we make a case that this is important? First of all, you make a case by arguing about output, not about input. And this is the biggest, most crippling problem for the development community, whether it is on the private sector side or the other side, which is that we talk about how much money we've put in. I went to the State Department website. I went to the AID website. I went to the MCC website. I kept looking for the reports about how the money that we've spent in places like Tunisia and Egypt and Haiti has really rocked the situation, changed it, transferred you know, a country that was uh, destitute to a country that was successful and self-reliant. Um, and of course, the answer is, damn. It, they haven't. Now, there are success stories. There's no question. But the measure of a success story is not, I spent $5 billion there. The measure of a success story is transforming societies so that they are partners, so that they are self-reliant, and so that they are, in fact, models of democratic capitalism. And here's the challenge. Right? We need to figure out a way to make that case. To me, this is an opportunity, perhaps an unwelcome one, to reform the State Department, to reform AID, to do the kinds of things. And also, by the way, as it has been to reform DOD, these things don't happen easily. But there can be a consensus built around the kinds of things that are necessary, personnel, bureau structures, NAID, the way we administer assistance, the revolving door, the cronyism that exists within our aid community. All of those things can actually be fixed. So. While we're competing with the uh, construction work that seems yeah. to be going, that seems Don't to have started, worry. maybe someone's trying to get in to join the conversation. I hope so. Um, Doubtless, that's it. So let's pick up on uh, the point about reform. Um, it looks like big cuts are coming. I mean, maybe if not 37%, we don't know. We may find out later this week. Uh, what would that actually mean? What are your ideas for then achieving greater? I mean, you were talking about outputs, but it's actually outcomes, I think. Uh, what are your ideas for achieving greater impact, greater outcomes with fewer resources? Uh, and what are some constructive approaches if cuts are coming? We'd like to kick off on that. OK, let me just come back. So I, I think as a starting point on that kind of conversation, what's, what's not? I want to come back, because Jim quoted, you know, I, I think, a commission from 2001 that characterized USAID. Well, that's 15 years ago, and frankly, I, as I look at that agency, it is a very different agency today. Now, the problems of earmarks remain, uh, which is a problem that, that does deserve attention, and particularly engagement with Congress um, uh, to look for reforms there. But as a starting point, I do worry that you know somehow we're characterizing a system that is fundamentally broken, and that is just not the case. Uh, we can point to areas of effectiveness. You, you pointed to some. You know, let me point to another one. Our, our colleague here, Amanda Glassman, pointed out, uh, if you look at the PEPFAR program uh, in one country in Malawi, which is a country where most of the population lives on less than $2 a day, uh, and they simply do not have the resources uh, to address really fundamental health issues, PEPFAR alone is serving over 500,000 uh, people in Malawi um, effectively uh, in terms of HIV treatment. Uh, absent PEPFAR and with deep reductions, those you know that population is not going to be served. That's an outcome, um, and and you can. Apply uh, could you just mention something other than PEPFAR, because uh, that's the one I always and almost only hear. Power um, Africa, not that either. Yeah. So look, uh, I'm not sure what you meant by the Obama administration kicking the crap out of MCC. I think they've been supportive of MCC. I think you can find evidence of success in the MCC programs. And with, within each of the areas. But just give us some. Give us some, don't give us some of the shining lights of success that you think make the case. And I'm asking you that honestly, because I want to be able to use them too. What are they? Malaria. 
food security. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the basic humanitarian <clears throat> stuff that you heard from Jim. We all support. I'm talking about the transformative stuff that's meant to be forming the building blocks of change in these societies so that we are on a glide path away from assisting them. Yeah, and I think things like malaria and food security is, uh, they're not just basic human There are about needs. 20 million people on the verge of starvation yeah. in Africa right now. Yeah, and there are <laughs> countries that have not embraced uh, what's been done, food security, of putting together integrated market economies that uh, are much more productive. Uh, and you look at Feed the Future and where it's been successful and the stunting numbers that it's reduced, it's been very effective. And we're seeing the, the counter of that in countries that have not embraced this kind of systems approach. In the South Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, they're having real problems. You know, that famine is always avoidable and it's almost always um, a direct consequence of mis and mal governance. Uh, so, you know, we see a very clear track record of where it's worked and where it hasn't. You know, the malaria, President's Malaria Initiative launched by George W. Bush has been enormously effective because it hasn't just looked at malaria, it's looked at health systems as a whole. It's one of the most effective integrated health approaches that we've seen across administrations. It's a fantastic unsung story. Um, you know, and I, I do think there are uh, other areas where I certainly agree with Jim. You know, I think foreign assistance is way too spread out. You know, we, uh, in an average year, deliver economic and security assistance in around 145 different countries on the planet, that's too many. We should focus it where we think it's going to be successful and where governments are making a real commitment. Um, you know, but at the same time, the idea that we're going to trust this administration, and I, and I understand they are delicate flowers and I should not offend their sensibilities. It's uh, not that. It's either that you want to satisfy yourself by being, by being pointed and unpleasant and ad hominem, or you want to get something done. I get, I get what you're saying. There are plenty so, of people I so can't stand. So you think healthcare but it is running help. into problem because okay, I'm, I'm not talking about healthcare. Showing up. Okay, John, I'm going to step in. This I don't is, know anything okay, about healthcare. I'm going to step John. in here. This is very interesting. We could debate the relative merits of yeah. USID for the rest of the session, but I want to focus you on what next. Let us assume there are cuts coming. I want to hear what your ideas are for where those cuts could be most effective. Do we reform the whole system? Do we slice, slice, slice? And if so, where? Where could these happen? Where happened? We, we do more with we less? We should reform the whole system. OK, so we give us some ideas on that front. We shouldn't be operating out of the, off the Foreign Assistance Act, which is older than I am. And that's saying something. Uh, the Foreign Assistance Act could be rewritten. I would love it's to see 22 that. 22 years old? Yes. <laughs> 24, please. Um, the Foreign Assistance Act is a, is a great place to start. Every single chairman, no matter what party of the Foreign Relations Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee that's come in and said, this is what I want to do, they haven't done it. People say, oh, no, it's been updated. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know how many of you pay attention to it. We don't really know how many volumes it is anymore because we don't see volumes anymore. But uh, when I left the Hill 15 years ago, it was six or eight. Uh, it's it's highly inefficient, and in that sense, I I think a lot of the earmarking, the special interests, the carve outs, the way we do business, it actually does parallel the Pentagon, which is that it is crippled by our lawmakers. I'm actually a big fan of earmarks because I think they bring out into the open what it is that that people are calling for. Uh, so I don't think I think Congress made a big mistake in pulling them out. I think those are things that, that need to be that need to be addressed. I do believe that we should be pulling AID further into the Department of State. I realize that for those who don't love the Department of State, that's a difficult thing. But in fact, it is hard to make a case to the American people that our assistance should not be tied to our policy exigencies and our policy people are at the Department of State. Not that AID is, is, is not supporting policy, but I don't think that they're bound close enough. These are among the things that could be done. We could get, we discussed this in the green room, we could get rid of all the bloody special envoys. Every single workaround that exists because there's money or because someone's carved it out should be addressed in a way that streamlines these agencies and maximizes the money for doing things rather than for paying for people. So there's Jim, a concrete suggestion. Uh, exactly right. I agree. And the, it may be that one reason you're seeing a, uh, a slowness in filling positions is that the administration is looking for a big overhaul of the state uh, organization chart, which uh, we, have, we have suggested. Uh, to uh, to eliminate all the special envoys, which have a diluting effect really on the on the efficiency, the effectiveness, uh, and the organization of state itself, uh, where I spent 25 years. And so, 
uh, I think that the regional bureaus need to be back in charge, I think, and the, uh, the functional bureaus need to be pared back drastically. St AID needs to be incorporated at the desk officer level, and you can have a new cone called Economic Development Cone, uh, where people who are expert at giving grants and that sort of thing. You don't have to have a whole separate structure. That'll save a lot of money. If you, and if you're worried about this draconian cut, that's one way to save money that's not going to impact. Another thing is food security. The food security, get rid of the Jones Act, get rid of the demands that uh, our food be delivered and U.S. ships, or U.S. crews, you have a lot more food available to, to help the people in humanitarian situations. Yeah, and I certainly agree on the food aid reform, and that's a battle that uh, uh, left and right have joined together to fight in this town, and hopefully we can make some, some progress on that. Um, as I said, I think we could be uh, a lot less disparate in how we handle aid and hand it out. Um, but, you know, I think that there's an important lesson here in looking at how reform is handled. DOD is really good at a lot of things because they train their people to do it. You know, uh, average officer spends uh, about 20, 25 percent of their career being trained for specific operations. One, at the State Department, we invest far less in training. Uh, most Foreign Service officers um, get very de minimis training, even in diplomacy. And they've had zero training in development. And thinking that we can just hand them the keys to development and that it'll work well um, is a fool's errand. Uh, we have a lonely Secretary of State right now. Um, I don't know how, after reading the stories of the last couple weeks, where you know we've got a Secretary of State that isn't staffed well enough to know that press pays their own way on the plane. Uh, and could kind of come out and say, well, we're not taking press because it'll save money. You know, an obvious blunder, an easily avoidable blunder. Why we're going to hand this guy right now another agency to manage with a bunch of officers and foreign service officers in state who are lousy at managing money and have no experience in development and think that's going to work well, I think that will replicate the uh, provisional authority in Iraq where we put a bunch of people in charge who'd never done this stuff and it ended disastrously. Isn't training foreign service officers better in development going to cost more money? How's that going to save money? Yeah, no, that's the other thing is that uh, one of the dirty secrets of managing change in the U.S. government is it's expensive to move people around. It's expensive to fire people. Uh, a 37 uh, percent cut is going to mean a reduction in force almost assuredly. And you know what you get with a reduction in force? You get to fire all the smart young people in your agency. And you get to keep those who are older, who've been around a long time, and have more civil service protections. And it means over time that you've got some very junior employees, some very senior employees, and you've got no middle. It, you have to pay buyout packages. It's very hard to manage. Uh, OK, that's the problem. What's the solution to that? You know, is to actually approach uh, managing budget reductions with, with a plan uh, that um, employee freezes uh, are not helpful. You want to bring some people on. You want to figure out attrition. You want to figure out your priority areas. And you need to consult on the Hill. None of this stuff was consulted on the Hill. So we're going to have people who care about PEPFAR, people who care about malaria, people who care about kids' education. It's going to play out as a classic special interest battle on the Hill. Scott. I agree with you. So, yeah, so let me offer um, a couple more ideas for uh, cost efficiency. But on this point, I mean, the other thing I would say about uh, how you're organizing things, the USAID state relations. Let's recognize that under the most robust, autonomous development agency model, uh, it is never going to be on equal footing, uh, sort of in an interagency process uh, with the Secretary of State. Uh, so, you know, I, I simply don't have the worry that somehow uh, our development agency is off doing its own thing in a way that's not aligned with national interests. Um, and then, frankly, if, if you move to a model where it is folded back in, um, you know, setting aside all the practical problems, you do risk losing what has developed as, a, as really a, a credible and important policy voice in interagency discussions. And I, I certainly saw this in, in my participation in these kinds of conversations, that you, you do sometimes need that agency to stand up and say, no, that's a dumb idea to do a project like that in a country like that. It's not going to work. Um, when there may be some broader imperative of engagement. But you do need the development actor in there trying to uh, do their best um, to, to move the discussion toward uh, questions of effectiveness. So let me give you a, a couple of broader ideas for um, both achieving better impact overall and doing it in a more cost-efficient way. 
So one that has, has been my direct interest for a number of years uh, is multilateralism. That in fact, if we, if we look at our overall foreign assistance accounts, the amount that's devoted to contributions to institutions like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, is actually quite small. Um, it has grown a little bit uh, in, in recent years, but not by much. Um, this is money that, the money that does flow uh, is leveraged tremendously in, from a financial perspective by the contributions of other countries, by the very financial model of the institutions themselves, and, and it's spent effectively. Um, so if we're in an area of, do, era of doing more with less, I think we ought to look at um, uh, what our contributions look like, what our leadership looks like in these multilateral institutions. The politics of that are hard right now. That's, that's the reality. I, I don't see um, in the current environment a, a big warm embrace of, of international organizations, unfortunately. And then more broadly, I think as part of a process, particularly of engaging with Congress um, and trying to address uh, the, the challenge of being in perhaps too many countries trying to do too many things, is uh, we ought to be looking at the array of countries uh, with, with whom we're engaged and, and think about a better matching of our instruments and programs with the actual needs and, and financing capacity of the countries themselves. I, I think. Uh, we are still vastly and predominantly a, a, a provider of grant assistance to countries. Uh, it's not to say that we should move to only being in countries where there is a clear need for grant assistance. We actually have interest in a wider group of countries. But the challenge, I think, is to find ways to be engaged uh, using financial instruments. Uh, you mentioned OPIC earlier. OPIC's a good example of, of certainly non-grant engagement with countries. Uh, what does a lending instrument look like in, in uh, some of these contexts um, that you know, recognizes the ability of countries um, to pay back a loan versus uh, s s simply receive a grant uh, from the United States? I think that's the kind of, it's a, it, that would be a challenging conversation to have and to work out, but that's the kind of thing I would like to see as part of a, a deeper dive into a process of reform. Jim, I imagine yeah. you're wanting to get in yeah, on Yeah, just a few points uh, in response. Uh, on OPIC and on the Exim Bank, uh, as you know, Heritage has, a, has uh, it's, uh, wanted that they be uh, basically dismantled or deconstructed, maybe that's the term, but I think gone away uh, because uh, they promote cronyism uh, at this point. And so, but that's uh, maybe another discussion. But getting back with So even the, though OPIC returns money to the Treasury? Well, it still gives... Uh, an advantage to, to more powerful versus le less powerful uh, companies, I think. So that's, we have called for it to be abolished because these are big companies that can afford uh, private insurance. They can afford uh, you know, the, the interest rates in the, in the world markets. They don't need subsidies from the taxpayers. But also on the, on the issue of, getting back to my thought about the Hudson Institute Global Philanthropy uh, Index and the idea of the giving by private citizens to help people around the world. You may know that there's an Evangelical Financial Council on Accountability, EFCA, that grates groups for how much overhead they have versus how much aid they actually give. I think that kind of metric should be applied to government programs also. Uh, and when PEPFAR under Bush 43, PEPFAR was, was at the Centers for Disease Control. It wasn't that AID. That was a very conscious reason because CDC did a better job for less money. It was more effective uh, in terms of delivery of the assistance. Uh, someone mentioned the MCC uh, as being a good example, and, and we agree. And, uh, Heritage was really arguing in favor of setting up the, uh, the MCC back in 2000. But we have uh, seen uh, under Obama, that was the only area, and I mentioned the 74% increase in 10, 10 years. MCC was the only one that was really cut. And that's really the one that is, that is supposed to uh, teach, teach a man or woman how to fish so they can fish for themselves by doing a once-over, big focus on a project with a lot of infrastructure components, get the institutions better, get the buy-in, the country ownership, the accountability from the governments, the MCC effect, and then, they're, and then they're on their own, and then they can do it because they have all these resources. And, and today we have, and the idea that the USAID is not going to be at the table, well, you guys, I mean, Center for Global Development is at the table, and social media is at the table. There are plenty of voices that are going to be raised about policies that are, that are being proposed. So I'm not worried about not having enough input there. What about the point of multilateralism? Scott was making? Yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, we've seen at the United Nations, uh, my colleague Brett Schaefer has written extensively on 
how the United Nations has been so focused on being anti-Israel, and they spend probably 60% of their time or their money or their efforts uh, condemning Israel as opposed to uh, you know, bringing world peace or bringing uh, solutions to problems. Uh, and so we don't think that giving UNDP more money is going to uh, really help anybody. So we're going to be supportive of cuts uh, to the UN budget, for example. But I think this administration certainly has shown a proclivity toward more bilateral solutions, uh, replacing the TPP approach with uh, bilateral trade agreements. So, uh, so that, I think, and I, I don't think you could expect to see a big move toward multilateralism by this administration. Anya. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, uh, look, AEI doesn't take institutional positions, uh, so I, I can't say that AEI thinks. And in fact, we have many different we have many different viewpoints on on, on a variety of these questions. So, speaking only for myself, um, you know, one of the reasons why I like OPEC um, is I, I mean, I agree with you that I agree with you that the markets should speak for themselves. It would be nice. And any time you put a government bureaucrat in charge of directing this sort of thing. You, um, you have the concern that those with the loudest voice, wh whether in the private or the public sector, get the most attention. At the end of the day, though, if we want the private sector to be the engine of global development that I believe it is, frankly, you know, I don't think there's anybody in this room, I hope there isn't, who would disagree that the future of global development and the most impact in terms of transformation comes from the private sector and from, from businesses seeking to employ people overseas, moving business overseas, starting, you know, starting uh, to transform foreign countries in ways that we really want to see. Uh, obviously, that's not the basic human needs stuff that we're talking about. But I guess my view is that, is that the role that OPEC and Exxon play is that they go to places that they would not otherwise go, that businesses, when they choose where to go, sometimes will not choose a certain place because of risk, because of impressions, for whatever reason, and that, and that government can help them. As long as, to my mind, if it's not costing the taxpayer money, even though it does have some downsides, as Jim rightly says, I think there is a rational case to be made for it. But again, you know, look, if, if you can build consensus around a, a set of ideas, and, and even though we all disagree here, there is a, there is a, there's a kernel of consensus, that is the right place to start. Rather than rather than you know, what we don't like, what do we like? How can we fix these things? I think there is consensus around personnel reform. There is not consensus around multilateralism, not just by the Trump administration, but by Republican members of Congress and, frankly, the American people who do not like the idea that even though you make the argument that you leverage it, that we are somehow subcontracting to a supranational institution that is not answerable to the American people and to the Constitution is not going to be a big seller. You can argue until the cows come home, but the bottom line is, you know, I worked at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for Jesse Helms for 10 years. It's not a seller. Let me tell you, not in North Carolina, not in a lot of places. Um, but, but what are the areas of consensus? How can we build on those? How can we build things that really have a lot of impact? Right, what you rightly said, not outputs, outcomes. Uh, and make those cases. I think you're absolutely right. PEPFAR, malaria, there are other things. We don't want to rely on the US military either. We don't want the military to be a deliverer of assistance. We don't want them to be doing development. And so the argument that you know, when, you don't build, when you don't build the right instruments at AID and at state that the military ends up doing it, as it so often did in Iraq, is totally correct. And they shouldn't be in the business of doing it. Sometimes they're more efficient, but in the long term, that's not what we pay them for. You don't go to your recruiting office in order to build a school. Great when you do, makes you really happy, but it's not what it's for. So, all of these things form, I think, the basis of a consensus that actually is the beginning of an intelligent conversation in which you can bring together, we can bring together members of Congress who are hesitant about the 37%. You know, I talked to Lindsey Graham this weekend. He said, not a chance. So that's great. But you know, there are budget cuts. There are other members. This has to get through the House and the Senate. Ideally, we would like to see bills passed in regular order, not a bunch of money crammed into a SUP. Not, or a CR at the end of the year. These are things that, that we should be able to begin on to build and reform and ultimately resource the things that we believe are vital and important. So that's the big you know, idea. That's very cogent and constructive. Quick point, yeah. John, and then, Thank Scott, you. then we'll move on. You know, and I, I think there's an important uh, footnote to add to that and the, the conversation about OPIC and MCC. And, you know, and obviously everybody likes the MCC model, that countries that are committed to development, that are well-performing, that meet clear standards, that deliver on those results. That's what's not to like. 
you know, it's Garrison Keillor. All the, uh, all the students are above average. Uh, but the problem is the big challenge for the United States and for development is increasingly not that portfolio. Uh, most of the extreme poor live in fragile states. Uh, an overwhelming majority of them are going to live in fragile states within the next 10 years. How do we deal with these countries that have real problems of instability, that don't have great institutions, uh, that aren't necessarily very committed to development? Do we just shun them aside? Do we not pay attention? Do we only do humanitarian assistance? That's the challenge that we're going to increasingly face as, as a country, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, I was also encouraged that all the panelists have spoken out uh, about the importance of dealing with cronyism. Uh, and I hope that Donald Trump and Ivanka and Jared and Donald Jr. are equally committed to that fight against cronyism. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> can't you brought me to the point of uh, uh, crisis response, which is great, which is where I want to go to. But Scott, just finish up uh, on this point. Then yeah, we'll move on so to I'm, I'm not prepared to walk away from multilateralism just yet. So let me say, uh, let me come back on this point. Even in the politics, uh, I don't think you can reconcile a desire to ask the rest of the world to carry more of the load with uh, an agenda that is essentially walking away from the institutions where you do that. Uh, it is about the burden the largest sharing. financiers of every single one of these institutions. I don't think you can suggest we are walking so away. So at the moment, yeah. uh, the US is less than 10% of World Bank contributions and, uh, and with the next, other countries and the next largest is. But let me, go, let me, let me make a, a specific point and, and to highlight one of my other colleagues, Charles Kenny, who pointed out, if we look at the vast amount of contributions of the UN, this is peacekeeping operations, uh, the US pays about $24,000 per UN peacekeeper. That compares with $2 million per US troop deployed into a combat situation. Are we really prepared to walk away from those kinds of arrangements whether it's on the military side or on the development side, we're at the very point in which we are actually getting greater burden sharing, much greater leverage, and a lot of say in the way, particularly the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks operate. Uh, I can tell you that when we start cutting by a third, uh, our voice will be diminished, our policy voice will be diminished. 28%, so, that's what we contribute for peacekeeping, 28%. Okay. Let, and let's not forget, what we're talking about is a Republican government that w doesn't want to keep this deficit of $20 trillion in the United States going on forever. So that's why there's this hard cap. That's why if you increase the Pentagon and discretionary, you have to decrease $54 billion. And in terms of helping these very bad off countries, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, often, too often, USAID and other, uh, DFID from the UK, other sources of donor aid have propped up kleptocracies that have been in power for 20 and 30 years in those countries. How are we going to get around that problem, I think, is, is one of the issues. Uh, let's talk about this point about being a development leader. Uh, what impact does massive cuts in the foreign affairs budget have on a, America's role as a development leader? Should it be a development leader in the future? I, I, I think in the United States, as, as it... Uh, its economy uh, continues to grow, I think, in the next couple of years, which we've seen so far signs of the stock market cer certainly thinks it will. Uh, you have tax cuts coming. You have cuts in regulation. It's going to stimulate business. Uh, that's going to be good for the United States. It's going to be good for our trading partners. Uh, I think uh, that is a better way to help the world uh, than by you know, having the, you know, the U.S. be the leader at the DAC, at the OECD in Paris, of the percentage of the GDP given. Uh, and not to mention the fact that the defense budget of the U.S. helps the whole world in many ways also. So I, I'm not worried about our position as a leader in the world I'm, as when our uh, economy recovers. Uh, how does that model help people in fragile and conflict states where the majority of poor people are going to be in the future? No, because, because the argument that we made goes two ways. Just as it is absolutely appropriate that we don't look at the military as a tool that does everything, we still need to look at the military as a tool that does a lot of things. And it is that partnership that I think that all of us value. You know, it is, it is, it is not just you know, fighting uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is the global commons, right? It is the South China Sea. It is the trade that goes through there. <coughs> it is the products that are developed in, in so many countries that go through all of these, whether it's the Strait of Hormuz or it's, you know, or it's through or it's through the Malacca Straits or wherever it is, it is we who make sure that they are able to go that way. So I mean, I, I, I have 
you know, I have no doubt about our leadership capacity, even if we try to withdraw. Um, but in terms of the fragile states, I think we need to recognize that there is a there is certainly a security component, and that that security component requires us to have a military presence, a strong military. This is where I would argue with the Trump administration. I don't want us to pull our troops out of Africa. I want to be I want to assure that that we're there, not just because of Al Qaeda, but because of the growing proliferation of these fragile states. There is absolutely a role to be played, and sometimes. There is only a role to be played by the military in stabilizing because we can't get aid people in there. Look at Yemen. You know, I mean, that's a situation where we cannot basically cannot work on the ground, okay? But where we have options, working with allies and otherwise. And then we want to be able to work with our allies to ensure that the kind of aid that is delivered is in fact the kind that is sustainable. Finally got that word in there. It's all lovely. <laughs> um, but it, it, that is a real issue. Okay, uh, Scott and John, is a military solution in crisis, uh, uh, fragile states, uh, addressing the symptom or the problem, the underlying problem? Well, you know, I, I want to touch on, on Jim's point uh, first. But, you know, I, I think trade, immigration, security alliances clearly do have more influence on development than development uh, institutions, than AID, DFID, you know, that they are big, huge tectonic shifts and. Uh, how markets and people develop. Uh, you know, and I think that the uh, big institutions that we've had in terms of relatively free trade, a, a commitment to NATO, uh, a growing alliance of stable countries that are committed to the same set of values has been enormously helpful for development. And it has helped the human condition advance more in the last 50 years than any other period in human history. Uh, you know, I don't think starting a bunch of trade disputes and going at some of our core military alliances is going to do much for international development at the end of the day. You know, and I, I don't think that we, I don't think whether the United States is a leader in development, you know, I don't think that's really the right way to go about it. That suggests that we invest in development because we want to be a leader, like we want to be first in class. No, we've invested in development because it's been a relatively low cost, pretty smart investment in how we do things. Uh, I think dealing with fragile states, an area where I've spent a lot of my career, you know, we're not very good at building effective institutions or shaping effective institutions in the developing world. Almost everyone in this room who works in development knows that if you had to pick one key barometer of whether a country is going to be successful or development or not, you would probably pick effective institutions as the, if you could get one thing to go into the battle with, that'd be the one you'd go with. Uh, and yet, as an international community in the country, we're not very good at shaping that. And I think some of the um, things that we got away from in terms of education and training and even Fulbright scholarships early on uh, actually were reasonably effective at doing it that. So, you know, I think we have to make our way back to our roots in some ways. Okay, last point to Spot, Scott, about the uh, how can America uh, be a player in crisis response with a smaller foreign affairs budget or a larger military? Yeah, more broadly, I mean, the leadership, I mean, it, to me, it's, I mean, if we look at a situation like, um, you know, what is unfolding with an unprecedented degree of a famine in terms of the populations that are that are implicated right now uh, in four countries, you know, it's unthinkable to me that we would not step up in that kind of situation and recognize the role that, that we have played, uh, particularly historically. Um, more broadly on the question of leadership, um, yeah, fair enough, I, and it certainly is not a political winner to spend a lot of time talking about how the U.S. must lead uh, on this agenda. On the other hand, let's recognize the, the benefits we've received from this over many decades is that um, uh, as the leader uh, broadly in the international system, we've managed to set the rules of the road uh, for the system in, in a lot of key respects in ways that um, certainly have benefited us and I think have been a global good. And that's, that should not be taken as a given, uh, particularly in the absence of U.S. leadership. Um, and the rise of, of emerging players, uh, including emerging players on foreign assistance who uh, perhaps have a different worldview, who are less concerned about sort of global good issues and global standards and norms that, that we tend to take a, a, as a given, even on the most uh, weedy and boring issues as procurement policy. What makes a good procurement policy? Uh, we have views on that, and we've pursued them in a way that, again, have been good for developing countries, have been good for us. Um, 
they should not be taken as a given when it when it comes to to new development actors, new providers of of assistance, and and you know there's real damage that that we could see unfold in the years ahead if we are increasingly absent and others are increasingly present. I, Jim, I, I, just, I think actually, you know. Jim, Heritage I just want, I'm going to ask you to hold that point. All right. I'm sure you'll be able to get it in when there's okay. questions because I want to move to questions because we've got right. a little okay. bit over on the discussion. Um, so I'm going to open this up now to audience questions. Questions also on the live stream and on Twitter. Uh, you know how to send them to us in the comment section and also via uh, at CGDev. <laughs> Hashtag CGD Talks. We have a couple of microphones going around. Uh, I'll take three questions at once. Uh, if I call on you, please uh, <coughs> stand up, say your name, your affiliation, and then I invite you to make a concise question as opposed to a long, <laughs> a long response. Uh, so, gentlemen at the front here, and then this is three gentlemen. That's not very good, ladies. Come on. Uh, this gentleman in the second row, and then that gentleman over there. Oh, and then we'll come to you, Matt. Tom Kimberly Consulting. But thank you very much for the entire panel, but um, the question I would like to ask is the administration has a number of international, uh, le at least international impacting policy initiatives it's committed to, and it's, I would like to get a response about what you think that is going to do, both about the priorities between the, in the residual uh, foreign affairs budget and uh, um, the size of the budget of the whole, and those, the three that I would suggest are first, limiting illegal immigration, apparently probably uh, cutting down legal immigration as far as HB1s and so forth are concerned. That's one. Second thing, we know that these Marines are going to uh, uh, the Middle East if there is uh, uh, armed conflict in a high level, relatively li uh, heavy, large degree of armed conflict in Syria. And I guess the third thing is, um, if we uh, start cutting off, uh, sort of move to a more protectionist uh, pose in terms of international trade. So it seems to me all three of those are likely to affect the needs for the services and uh, goods provided under the foreign affairs budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, gentleman just behind you, actually. Good morning, Anthony Garrett from Internews. A uh, question for Daniel Pletka. Uh, we are hoping, uh, many of us, that people, leaders such as yourself, will go into the administration. And can we hope that a number of leaders from AEI might come in? Is that, is that a planted question or what? <laughs> 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 okay. Hi, my name is Taylor Williams, and I'm a health policy manager at RTI International. Um, I've heard some small bore ideas for cutting the budget, the XM Bank, OPIC, reforming food aid, but the fact is the majority of what USAID does is global health, is the sorts of things the four of you were saying are effective, PEPFAR, PMI, eliminating uh, neglected tropical diseases. So what happens when we have a 37% cut to global health? The one thing that all four of you are saying is very effective. Okay, let's get some responses. Let's take that last question first, actually. What happens when there's a 37% cut to global health, which is something that uh, you've all said is effective? I don't, think that, I don't think we all said it was effective. I think we all said that these were worthy programs and that some of them were effective. I, the one thing that I am persuaded of is that we do not administer any of our programs effectively. And, and that is simply the administration. Um, so you know, that, that is one option. And uh, frankly, I think it has been derelict of Congress, no matter who's been in control, not to have better oversight into how our programs are administered. Now, are we going to save boatloads of money that way? Um, we may not. But the, argument, but the argument for continuing those programs will be all the more effective if their overhead, if, if like Charity Navigator, to pick another, if the overhead for them isn't, you know, 60% here in Washington among friends of whoever it is and 40% over there. I see you shaking your head. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is that is an important place to start. Uh, you know, I, I think the inefficiencies in administration, a lot of them go back to the, the Foreign Service Act and the fact that we've the got this act, yeah. crazy kudzu of regulations over how we how we do things. So um, I think that's part of the problem, and I, I'm not very optimistic that'll get cleared up. 
you know, I don't think we'll see it across the board cut. That's not how it works. But, you know, it is going to be uh, defenders of PEPFAR will speak up for PEPFAR. Defenders of democracy will speak up for democracy. Individual groups will go lean on their individual members of Congress. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be um, a, a very heated fight. Uh, but, you know, obviously the, the bottom line is if we have a lot less money in these areas, that we'll see a lot less programming and uh, we'll very quickly see what works and what doesn't. And, you know, I think in areas like uh, the global gag rule, we've got very clear evidence of the shift from Mexico City policy back and forth over the years of how many more abortions it's meant, how much uh, the increase in maternal mortality, uh, what it looks like. We've got very clear numbers of the devastating effect. Uh, and we've got an administration that has embraced a wildly expanded version of a global gag rule that may well affect PEPFAR and may well affect malaria programs. So, you know, in those areas where we're good at counting, like health, we'll see very clear effects down the road. And those areas that are harder to capture and harder to put into numbers in terms of institutions, in terms of democracy uh, and, or trade, you know, it'll, it'll be very hard to figure out the impact. Scott. Yeah, no, I think, look, it's, it's important. You have to recognize where the money is. And, um, you know, look, I'm not a fan of Paul Ryan's views on entitlement reform, but I give him credit for going where the money is. Um, and, you know, w within our foreign assistance programs, if you're going to achieve cuts of the scale that they are launching this process with, uh, this is unavoidable. And then to sort of, you know, if, if the response is, well, it is about cost efficiency and, and better administration, well, you know, again, there's just a different scale of, of savings that we're talking about here. And um, we do need to recognize that the starting point for this process with this administration is cuts that, um, that will unavoidably be damaging to the programs, even if we find a process that unfolds that achieves greater, greater efficiency in, in the implementation of them. Um, that's clear. And then, I mean, you know, this is, an, if you look at the non-aid examples of policy, um, refugee policy, and what we saw with the executive orders, it does seem to me that this administration will have an interest um, if it is not willing to accept refugees into the United States uh, to be trying to do more, be more effective in supporting countries that are hosting those refugees, so the Jordans and Lebanons. But see, um, there you but how, are making the mistake again of thinking that there is a logical policy and framework around this, and there is not. But if they are driven unavoidably to some kind of conclusion of that sort, and then find that they've, they've already cut the budgets. But yeah, fair enough. I don't know if uh, there's a thought process that is connecting those dots, but I, I, I am willing to sit here and connect them for them and you know, make the case that yes, they ought to be doing more and more effectively when it comes to engagement with third party hosts of refugees in the world. Um, that, in my mind, probably calls for the provision of greater resources. Okay, for the sake of practicality, I, let's assume there is a thought process joining the uh, dots. Yeah, I, um, you guys are Jim, I, I think probably some of our friends on the left are afraid that there is a logical and rational plan at work here, uh, because... Uh, anyway. And, and we're going to see it, but uh, yes, uh, I don't think unborn babies who are permitted to be born are going to think they were gagged, uh, by the way. Uh, I think that, that uh, when malaria was uh, said, uh, blocked as a, a possible use for malaria. Um, uh, DDT was blocked as a, as a use for anti-malarial activities. That was a mistake. I think that could be looked at again in very limited, controlled ways. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, you know, had a famous case in an Africa village where they distributed mosquito nets, and they came back a year later, and they and the farmer said, "Oh yeah, we didn't use those to protect the kids. We used them to protect the livestock." Uh, so. Uh, I think there are ways that you can, with less money, be more effective on health care. I think That's with other, example, other, the other parts of the question regarding immigration, one of the biggest problems with immigration is overstayed visas. It's not people coming over the border at night. I mean, that, the bigger problem is having a tracking mechanism to find out who's in our country, when did they get here, and when are they going to leave. On um, protectionism and trade, I, I think what you're seeing, uh, just as you're seeing with uh, talk about NATO by, by President Trump, is and these are disruptive sorts of ideas, the way Brexit was disruptive. I think uh, we're saying, yes, and Vice President Pence went to Europe and, and reassured the NATO allies that we are fully committed to NATO, but we want them to pay more. We want them to do things better. We want their militaries to be more efficient. And the same thing with our trade deals. I think what you're going to see is a, not, not protectionism, but a demand for a relook at some of these deals. Uh, it, with a mind to making them more effective and better for Americans. 
By the way, can we? I want to reclaim the word disruption. You know, Silicon Valley has pulled it in this positive direction, and let's recognize that disruption is not inherently a good thing. I wanted to, I, I, I asked for 10 seconds because um, we, uh, like all such Washington groups, haven't brought up two of the biggest um, budget sucks on, on development, which is aid to Egypt and Israel. And by the way, and I don't think my credentials as being a supporter of Israel can ever be in question, Israel does not need uh, foreign assistance. It, it just doesn't. That's a chunk of money. I think there are plenty of people within Israel who would agree with us. They have a GDP per capita that is higher than some of our states. Um, and so that's one. I also think that we ought to, you know, frankly, look more intelligently at what we do in Egypt. Those are two really big ones. Pakistan, you know, again, we're talking about fragile states, but the, the right question, and this is to echo, I think, what the American people would say about this. Has this money been effective in achieving the goals for which it was set out? And I think it's very hard, particularly in the case of Egypt and Pakistan, to make that argument. So, you know, all of these things that we sort of, you know, we all, well, we all like to tinker around the edges, yeah. you know, we really shouldn't do this program or that program. Those are big chunks, and everything should be on the table no matter what. I mean, there are examples <laughs> at the programmatic level of where aid to Pakistan has helped, for example, keep girls in school. Sure, there, there, there are. But I mean, the, these are the right, but budgetary support, I mean, damn, right? You know, we know what that is. We know what it is in the case of Egypt. Now, again, everything should be on the table. Okay. That's the right way to address it. So that brings me to a really good point that we got in from our live stream. This is actually from Eric Postel, formerly of USAID, uh, who says, how will changes discussed by the panelists add up to $6.9 billion worth of cuts? Uh, what specific <laughs> countries slash sectors should be defunded in ways that add up to those many billions? I'll Let's need a napkin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I want to echo Danny's point. You know, I think Pakistan and Egypt are great examples of places where, based on a national security imperative, we've poured money into a country. The aid people can say, look, this indicator, that indicator has improved over time. But we have not, this long partnership in both cases, have not produced a stable, well-functioning uh, country with good institutions uh, that are dedicated to relatively open trade and, and good security policies. So yeah, you can pour billions into a country, and of course the schools are going to get better, and of course the immunization rate is going to go up. But if you achieve the fundamental change you need in that country, and I think in places like Egypt and Pakistan, uh, the record is abysmal. And in Pakistan, I'd argue it's actually been counterproductive, mm -hmm. that our, our assistance has helped undergird a military government that is committed to a never-ending arms race with India, which it can never win because it is a fraction of the size of a country. You know, and until they with a kind less of functioning economy. Uh, with a less functioning economy. So until they get away from that notion, and until our aid stops undergirding that notion, it's not going to be an effective uh, country. So you uh, both pull aid to Pakistan. I don't think anybody's talking about pull. I think that everything should be. The problem is we're on autopilot. Yeah. And again, I think we would all agree that that there are big chunks. You want to talk about big money? It's on autopilot, and it's there for for foreign policy reasons that in and of themselves don't get revisited or tested against facts. You know, sometimes you hand out money because you know you're buying something. After 9-11, when we had cut off aid to Pakistan, we were handing out money to Pakistan. We had no clue where to spend it, how to use it effectively. We just wanted to go over with a helicopter and pour it over the country. And if people used it to wallpaper their walls, that was fine. But we were buying something in the wake of 9-11 that was important. But then we continue and continue. And these things should be on the table. And actually, there's a number of scholars here at CGD who would probably agree that if we just dumped money out of a helicopter in Pakistan, mm -hmm. it probably would have been more effective <laughs> as an assessment <laughs> strategy with a lot lower overhead. Perhaps not, perhaps not, not ending up in Swiss banks, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, but sir. yeah, I think this is a, a shock therapy sort of thing we're going to be coming up to this week. I think Thursday the budget's going to be released. So we'll find out what the real cuts are. And then we will have what the Heritage Foundation has been calling for for quite some time, which is a top-down review of everything, as, as my colleague said. And let's, let's tap the, the pros and cons and figure out how this fiscal year 2018 budget is allocated. So no ideas from you then, for, from Eric, to answer Eric Postel's question, 
about specific areas, specific countries, sectors? Well, I've already, I've already offered uh, quite a few ideas about uh, restructuring, integrating AID, which I think will, spend, will save quite a bit of money, uh, and that's, that's a start. Scott, anything to add on that question? Well, I'll just, I mean, if we are forcing ourselves into this box, I would be, I would be happy to join an approach that said, let's look at a handful of countries and take a very hard look and recognize that uh, we are dumping money uh, not from a development imperative, but a foreign policy imperative. So I think, uh, you know, I, let me express full support for that as, as an ex, as if that's the exercise. More generally, I just have, you know, I come back to, because, you know, let's recognize the political reality of that not likely happening. Um, so then we're back to this question of what is the process that makes sense? And again, I just find it um, deeply damaging to any credible and, and ultimately productive process to start with uh, cuts of this sort as, as the starting point. Um, I would like to see uh, this administration engage with the Hill. You know, there are a lot of Hill actors who uh, are highly credible, uh, knowledgeable on these programs. Let's have that kind of review process unfold over the next year. It's a good time at the start of an administration to do it. Um, but when you're starting with uh, two achieved cuts of this magnitude, um, you're already isolating really critical players uh, for for participating in what, what could be a credible exercise. Uh, okay. Daniel, 10 seconds. Yeah, the only thing I, I, I really want to counsel is not to engage in this Sisyphean battle about not having deep cuts. There are going to be deep cuts. The right thing to do is what you suggested at the end, which is to actually work with member of con members of Congress to do this in a way that is effective and intelligent. You're not going to like it, but it's still better to do it that way than to just have someone take an ax and kind of <laughs> That's my best suggestion. Okay, I want to get two more questions in, actually, John. Hold on. Uh, this lady on the front row here, then I have one on Twitter as well. That may be about it. We'll see. Good morning. I'm Jane Terry from the Organization of American States, and I'm very interested in the panel's um, look at the future of support for democracy. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we may get another question in there. Um, okay, so this is from Ruth Levine on Twitter. Uh, from the Hewlett Foundation, how do the speakers think that recipient countries will respond to deep cuts in aid? In aid, for example, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Philippines, Senegal. Do you care, Jim? Should we all just scream no together? <laughs> well, of course we care. We we care about about people around the world. And, but I think uh, this administration has made it clear that uh, President Trump said he was elected to take care of the American people first, and, and that is a difficult thing to wrap your head around for internationalists in Washington maybe, but that is the reality. Uh, and that is getting back to the idea that nation states matter and that, that number one, we're going to have to take care of our own country. And that was the hillbilly elegy kind of um, post-election analysis about the Rust Belt state vote and why people out in the middle of the country don't feel like Washington is listening. And maybe it is because uh, we are too much worried about some of these other countries, which are they deserve to be worried about, but how much of our tax dollars they get is really on the table. But no, it's, it, it, look, I, will never, I will never, as a conservative, sign up to the expression America first. Um, but but um, similarly, in aid from the United States, the money that American taxpayers earn is not an entitlement for anybody, ever. You know, I would just add a, a, a final point, uh, two very quickly. One, those high-profile examples that we all mentioned, the, the Pakistan, Egypt, places where aid was most misused, most misspent, were all high-profile places where the State Department thought it was fantastic to sink big portions of AID's budget. Thus, one of the problems with just sticking AID in the State Department. The second would be, no, don't just accept that cuts are coming. This is not a static process. We've seen it on issue after issue. The American people have stood up and said, no, we disagree with this. Call your representative. Make clear how screwing up international relations is not putting America first. It's putting America second or third. It is not treating America as a bright, shining city on a hill. It is just treating us as some other just drab company down country down in the pit with everybody else. Like, That's like not Greece. the America that... Reagan believed in, that's not the American FDR believed in, that's not the America I believe in. 
Now, on the other hand, you, you're worried about America's place in the aid world and the, whether our leadership is going to diminish. Our leadership around the world pulled back heavily across the board in the last eight years, and it's being reasserted now. And I think that's going to have benefits uh, for everyone. So let, let me just focus on Scott. Ruth Levine's question, because I think if we look at you know, let's recognize that this is a broad group of countries, diverse group of countries, and you will have the Malawis where if we see the kinds of cuts to PEPFAR that, that could happen, you know, we're going to measure the costs in, in actual lives in countries like that. For, for another group of countries, you know, there are many countries that increasingly the United States needs them at least as much as they need us. And our withdrawal from what have been effective instruments of engagement will mean that ultimately it is our national interest that, that is, that is uh, bearing the cost. And I think that's increasingly the world, you know, and, you know, the aid skeptics who, who want to broadly characterize the private investment flows to the developing world, other sources of flows, domestic resource mobilization, those are all signs of great success. And so what's the point of the U.S. engagement? Well, increasingly, again, it is about making sure that our interests um, are being served through these relationships. And often it is very small amounts of money that achieves that. And to walk away from those tiny bits of money in the context of our overall budget um, in a way that plays to the distortions that already exist and misperceptions on the part of voters about this, that somehow it is a matter of fiscal discipline. It is not, period. We will achieve nothing through these cuts when it comes to the larger fiscal stance of our budget. Okay. I think that's probably a good point to leave the discussion. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And I'd ask, invite you to give a round of applause to our panel. This morning. <laughs>